This is the 17th day of June, 1977. Man's most spectacular era is fading into history. This is pertaining to the basic philosophy that explains modern times. Let's begin with five questions. Do you feel that your personal position of overall security is assured beyond its present standing so you can look ahead into a future that is reasonably predictable? Are you satisfied that the affairs of government and the national economy are operating in satisfactory order? Do you find anything pertaining to your present way of life that is harassing, oppressive, or that you believe to be unfair in one way or another? Do you believe that our modern way of life is just normal to an age of rapid progress and should be accepted without questioning? Do you believe that our modern way of life represents an elevation in the level of civilization that offers more security, contentment, and happiness than ever before achieved? If your answers to these questions leaves you satisfied that all is well in your life, then the words to follow may have little meaning. But if you are not satisfied that all is well, you may find the answers you would like to know. If we believe something is not quite right and would like to do something to correct it, first it has to be determined just what is wrong, what allowed it to get that way, or what arrangement of things causes it to be the way it is. To state this very simply, first the truth has to be known. The truth is not necessarily something that can be assumed or taken for granted because it may be hidden in the illusions of deception. What we see and hear may be only bits and pieces of truth arranged to form an impression that is far removed from the reality. Precedent becomes important in searching for truth. If no precedent is available for reference, then it becomes very difficult to establish truth of circumstances because all things then have to be compared with known fundamental basics bit by bit. Some things are not possible to ever know in full truth without precedent or heritage. For example, if no one had ever seen a rattlesnake but saw only the rattlers on the tip of its tail in the crevice of a rock, no one could be found that would know that the thing visible was only part of a lethal snake. So where there is no precedent or heritage of knowledge to explain an existing condition, the condition must be brought into full light so an identifiable amount of it is exposed for prospective evaluation before it becomes possible to determine just what it is. Statistical two-dimensional facts and figures do not adequately reveal the complete nature of a thing or a condition. The third dimension of depth has to be added, so what lies beneath the surface becomes known. We have become so accustomed to assuming reality from illusions that we take things for granted as being a certain way by the illusion. For example, a flat picture with good shading of light in the details gives an illusion of depth. But if the picture is turned and viewed from the edge or the back side of it, it becomes readily apparent that it was only something thin and flat without substance of depth at all. A great deal of our knowledge about modern times comes from the flat picture seen on TV, and we are likely to assume that our impression is complete, undistorted truth. The camera angles may overemphasize as well as leave things out that are important in forming an accurate impression. Mentioning these well-known things may seem trivial, but when we realize that our modern existence is built as much upon the power of deception as it is truth, then the importance of basics will come into renewed appreciation. Only through basic truths will man be able to reestablish his rightful place in God's creation and find the direction to go. He has become blinded by his own lights, shining into the dense fog around his own deception. The reasoning power of individual mind has been so thoroughly tortured that it has become desensitized to recognition of truth. The individual has become victim of a very deliberate diabolical plan to reduce him into a willing unit of human power, enslaved in servitude under dictatorship. This is a profound accusation which will be thoroughly explained in seven topics as follows. 1. Visible effects in our modern way and their causes. 2. Departure from a natural means of existence. 3. Alteration in government. 4. How the power of society is enslaved. 5. Alteration in the economy. 6. Deviations in education and the loss of heritage. 7. Summary and conclusions. Now topic number 1. Visible effects in our modern way and their causes. 
When we scan the spectacle of our modern way of life, we see miracles of progress never before dreamed of. Digital wristwatches, pocket-sized radios, and electronic calculators, monstrous machines moving earth and superhighways bearing the wheels of modern transportation, while aircraft filled with people and cargo move five miles above the earth at ten miles a minute. We have sprawling high-rise cities whose lights at night outdo the glorious magnificence of the Aurora Borealis, while supertankers roam the seas to bring in oil from faraway lands to furnish the extra energy needed to make it all work. The superficial cause beneath this panorama of progress is an ever-accelerating boom in technological development, having come into its explosive rate of expansion only during the past 100 years. So all now living were born into this modern age of development and have become accustomed to the miracles of convenience it provides at the turn of a key, push of a button, or flip of a switch. There are other interwoven causes that are not visible from the surface. These hidden causes will come into light in the topics that follow. There is no precedent in all known history for our modern age because the species of man had lived for 5,000 years by other means of existence yet from time to time had found prosperity, contentment, and happiness. So it has to be concluded that although we may not fully realize it at this time, there was some other satisfactory way to live in the natural environment of the earth. This conclusion is proven by precedent and leads into the next topic. Now topic number two, departure from a natural means of existence. First, let me define what is meant by natural means of existence as applied in this discussion. A natural means of existence is the state in which all that is needed for man's survival is provided in the regenerative processes of nature and in the inexhaustible natural resources, such as the land, sea, and fresh water, all within proximity of man's natural means of obtaining. Until these modern times, man had lived within the restrictions imposed by this definition, whereas our modern existence violates them all but one. It must be concluded, then, that by the definition our modern way of life has departed from a natural means of existence. We still obtain bodily nourishment from foodstuffs produced in the regenerative processes of nature. But in the main, these are not produced within proximity of obtaining by natural means of transportation. Transportation now required to move essentials into and out of centralized processing facilities depends upon energy that is not regenerating by natural process, but is being removed from depleting deposits in the earth that are exhaustible. Lagging behind and fading out of local production of essential survival needs has shifted dependence onto long supply lines of transportation, which are not ruled out by the definition if the lines are powered by something regenerative like fuel from vegetation or from some form of energy naturally occurring, as in the wind, solar power, hydroelectric, the tides, and so forth. Sailing ships which roamed the seas for centuries did not violate natural means of obtaining, even though they represented long supply lines. The ships were built of materials that grew in nature and were powered only by the wind. To increase natural production of food to meet the needs of an increasing population, nature is being assisted by helping to arrange things in its processes to be more productive. This in itself does not violate a natural means, but the use of mechanized equipment for this purpose that runs on irreplaceable energy is in violation. The city has now become totally dependent upon transportation and the uninterrupted supply of energy for its utilities. Without transportation and utilities, the city dies in a matter of hours. Since there is not sufficient local production of all necessities for survival, those who might flee the city in time of disaster have little chance of finding within proximity of their means of travel all that would be needed to survive. Because of our total dependence upon energy, what we might do without it becomes unthinkable, but it would take only a little bit of war to bring on such unthinkable mass disaster. We have paid in billions of dollars for national security and have been told we have national security. We have been lied to. The whole scene is upside down. National security can be no more than the sum of strength in its independent, self-sufficient local communities and no individual has greater security than does his nation. 
Much of the tax money we have paid in to buy national security has been spent to set up an illusion of security that does not exist. Now let's see what the spectacular progress and a departure from a natural means of existence adds up to. Well, it adds up to a trap, the most powerful man-made trap ever conceived, unprecedented in all known history. When man began to discover what he could do with the energy he found in the earth, he forgot that he was a guest in God's creation, failed to ask himself where he was, what he was, why he was, and who he was. He decided, like Adam in the Garden of Eden, to strike out on his own, to go his own way and do as he pleased. He turned loose of all the natural things that guide man's way to grab and run with new unprecedented ideas with no proof of their validity other than his own fallible logic. Man had found a way to multiply his work power and productivity many thousandfold. It was no longer necessary to be conservative with anything. Everything was replaceable easily. Use it once and then just throw it away. So during all your lifetime and mine, we, every one of us, have been enthusiastically and frantically building ourselves into a man-made trap baited with energy. Everyone now is feeding from the bait and could not survive without it. The farmer tills his soil with a tractor, pumps his water with electric or gasoline power, goes into town in his truck to get supplies shipped in by truck or diesel train. His kids go to school by bus. There are very few flaws in the trap where any light can be seen through its powerful jaws. We have done a most remarkable job. It is such a perfect job, it is a superhuman accomplishment. We could not have done it so thoroughly without help from the spirit of Satan. For about the past sixty or so years, progress has been traveling on an unprecedented, uncharted course at an ever-increasing rate of speed. Progress has projected an illusion of man's own greatness. What better illusion of his self-sufficient superiority could be projected than by his trips to the moon? I am not condemning this accomplishment, only the deceptive illusion of man's own greatness that it has cast. At one time in man's history, there were no railroads, no electric lights, no telephones, no motorized vehicles, no radio, no TV, and no airplanes, no refrigeration. Yet without these, he from time to time found contentment, happiness, and flourished in abundant prosperity in his natural existence. We may think of this as an age somewhere far, far back in the ancient history of primitive man. This seems to be the modern prevailing impression, yet we think of the United States of America as a new modern nation that has always had most of the things named. Well, at the time the Founding Fathers declared independence of these United States from the powerful British Empire in 1776, just two hundred years ago, none of the modern things named a moment ago were in existence, no, not even the railroads. In fact, of all of the things named, only the railroads were in popular usage before the year 1900. So the natural means of existence is not nearly as far away as it might seem looking back into the past, or maybe even looking forward into the future. The technology we have developed is very valuable. There is nothing wrong with it except the way it has been used to satisfy a supernatural greed for wealth and power of only a few. The technology presently known is sufficient to generate a new booming economy turned toward dismantling our man-made trap and converting what could be salvaged for use in re-establishment of a natural way of life. We have the basic know-how, but will not have the incentive as long as the trap is kept well-baited and individual initiative is willfully repressed. Now topic number three, deviation in government. It seems most people have the impression that as our nation has grown, all the alterations made in government have been for the purpose of strengthening the national security, improving the general welfare, and fitting the government into the needs of modern times. But really, a very proportionate few of the changes made have been for these purposes. Man has never found the perfect way to govern his society, but the government structure prepared by our Founding Fathers is the best that has ever been conceived thus far. They recognize the fact that man is a guest in God's creation 
and that he is created individual with the divine right of choice. Their structure was prepared for government of a free society by representation of the individual preferences into a refined or distilled sum of these, bearing ascension of authority in government, to apply this sum to the society for popular satisfaction of its preferences. The structure was prepared such that government was always to be a servant of the represented will of the people, and the people could not become unrepresented servants of the will of government. The national spirit of freedom that grew out of their new structure turned out to be even greater than the letter of its documented laws implied. The new government inspired freedom of individual initiative as it has never before been inspired. Competitive individuality sprang forth into enterprise which began building a great free nation, and remember this happened while man was still living within the limits of natural existence. Independent, competitive, free enterprise was naturally guaranteed by the government, resulting in national growth becoming the sum of free, competitive, individual differences. Yes, I said free, competitive, individual differences. It is unfortunate that some words which appeared in the Declaration of Independence have been repeated over and over again in a different light from that of their origin. These words are, quote, and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal." Unquote. These words do not appear anywhere in the documentation of our constitutional representative democratic republic. The spirit in which they are usually repeated is contrary to the documentation of our laws for a free people. People from all corners of the earth came to the new land of the free, bringing with them their differences in ideas, in talents, in heritage, and traditions. The spectacular early growth of our nation rose out of differences instead of sameness or enforced equality. The new government had provided a way for a sum of mind to contribute to national growth and to the power of a national society under free self-government. This structure of society is not controllable under the will of any one or any few. It is a sum of mind power and human force that cannot be enslaved under dictatorship. But there are always a few in the world who become possessed with the satanic greed for power to enslave their fellow beings, then use their power for increasing personal wealth and in their conquest to gain power over and rule the whole world. There were those among us who had this satanic desire, and our powerful society had the power they wanted to use in their conquest. This called for their altering the government and this has been accomplished a little bit at a time using the strategy of gradualism. Alterations made over a period of years are too numerous to name, but those most significant have come through legislation built around the federal income tax, the multiple benefit programs including revenue sharing, the rights legislation, and the enactment of federal emergency authority. Through these legislative alterations, the individual citizen and local governing bodies have all been placed directly under the command of federal enforcement. The original government provided a buffer of ascending authority between the individual and local government and the federal level. The intermediate buffers are still in existence, but now federal authority bypasses or goes around these. We have lost effective representation in government at all levels and are now essentially enslaved under dictatorship at the will of a few. Topic number four, how the power of society is enslaved. Alteration in government provided the structural framework for enslavement of society, but perhaps it is even more important to understand the basic philosophy that makes it possible to herd people like so many sheep into the confines of a federal framework. There has to exist some form of weakness in society that makes it susceptible to becoming victim of evil manipulation. I believe that by majority we are a nation of honest, good-hearted people who want to do what is right, but I believe also that by majority we suffer from ignorance, complacency, and laziness, all of which exist to more or less degree in all people, I too having not been denied my individual share. Complacency and laziness are more a matter of individual preference, but ignorance becomes more a matter of truth being made available, withheld, or willfully distorted. Nevertheless, it is through the weaknesses in society that it falls victim of attack through channels of anonymity, incredibility, and philanthropy. 
These are the three keys to the use of power of the masses. The authority that is able to motivate and control the human power in the masses is nothing more than an illusion of power until it becomes supported by the real power in the masses. So it is the power of the people themselves that enforces all the things they don't want upon themselves. There is no source of real power other than that within the society itself. The first key, anonymity, explains the illusion of power. The masses are kept from knowing the exact source from which they are being ordered into action. Orders come down through a chain of successive authority, so it is assumed they must originate in some office of high authority even though the exact source remains anonymous. Furthermore, the individual does not have access to a level of authority where he can question the validity of orders. Authorities available at the level of the individual are many in number, but each holds only a small portion of the authority the individual is questioning, so it becomes impossible to trace orders back to the level of their origin. Now the second key, incredibility. Perhaps this is best understood in reference to something being incredibly large or incredibly small. It applies typically to orders which have an image of authority or magnitude of substance beyond the limits of reasonable understanding and are therefore incredible and unquestionable. For example, if it were announced by way of the communications media, for all men age 18 to 30, whose last name began with the letter A, to assemble at the nearest courthouse at 4.30 a.m. tomorrow morning by order of Federal Emergency Authority under penalty of law, it could be expected that all but a few would be there. To question such an order would be incredible. Its authenticity would just be assumed. There are occasions, though, when incredibility is applied in the other extreme, something incredibly insignificant, such as the 16th Amendment of 1913 legalizing the federal income tax. It was kept incredibly insignificant for a few years, but now look what it is costing society. The third key is philanthropy, which serves a double purpose. There are always a few with great wealth and in high position where it is possible for them to manipulate affairs of government and economy in their favor. These, if engaged in such manipulations, invariably cover themselves with a shield of philanthropy. Philanthropy gives them an aura of goodwill, benevolence, and generosity in the public eye, and buys or bribes those who are wiser. Philanthropy is also used to force the policies of institutions receiving funds, such institutions having to comply with dictated policies to become eligible for the funding. The power of money buys conformity. It may at first seem incredible that three such simple keys could explain how the power in society is enslaved and motivated to enforce upon itself its own self-destruction. Absolutely incredible. And that is why it works. Topic number five, alteration in the economy. There could be no organized society with a government without a supporting economy. Basically, the economy consists of producing what society needs and commerce in exchanging these needs. This includes work, services, raw materials, finished products, and a variety of less tangible effects, such as insurance, speculative investments, and so on. All that goes on in the economy has some kind of value assigned to it or relative to it. To prevent economic anarchy, there has to be a standard reference for exchanging things, which is, of course, money to bridge the path of exchanging between valuable elements as they are moving about. Without a fixed standard value for money, all other values become arbitrary and controversial. Well, in case you may have forgotten, the U.S. dollar has had no reserve backing for quite a few years now to give it a fixed reference value. Therefore, the dollar has become a commodity instead of a standard medium of exchange. Being a commodity, its value is arbitrary for lack of any fixed reference, so it is now worth different amounts at different levels in the society, in the economy, and in different marketplaces. Several things in the modern economy have turned onto a fatal course of self-destruction for a free economy, and this is just one of them. Free economy is being destroyed by corporate monopolies and by federal controls and regulations. Perhaps there is little need for particular concern about the economy, though, unless the closing jaws of our man-made trap, baited with energy, can be reversed.
No amount of controlling, regulating, and force feeding here and there by pushing funds around are going to stabilize an economy that has no standard reference of value. It will continue to inflate until it ruptures and collapses. A natural economy is self-regulating because it is held together by independent, competitive, free enterprise engaged in the supply of society's demands, and it has a standard reference for monetary exchange. Independent, competitive, free enterprise has a powerful sum of mind at work, very seriously watching all that goes on because the decisions of this mind means bread and butter or no bread and butter, profit or failure. Mistakes in judgment are made, of course. Wrong turns are made. Some lose out. People are not perfect. But the sum of mind keeps things ever rebalancing, and overall security is assured. It is my personal conviction that we would never have gone this far into an artificial man-made trap depending upon only one source alone for survival if the national economy had stayed within the hands of independent, competitive, free enterprise. Corporate monopoly centralization of big business has forced out competitive independence and thereby destroyed the mind that is needed to guide the course of the nation within the limits of a natural means of existence. It was not through the planning of independent, competitive, free enterprise that our very survival has been switched over to a total dependence upon only one irreplaceable source that is depleting. Progress in the last half century most likely would not have been nearly so rapid or frantic but we would not have run so far ahead that all assurance of survival was left behind. Independent, competitive, free enterprise does not operate with an overall high level of greed, because the greed that develops in it soon self-destructs. It has no manipulated source of self-regenerating wealth to keep it going, like the corporate monopolies have discovered. Topic number 6. Deviations in Education and Loss of Heritage The thing we refer to as education develops out of a need to carry forward heritage of knowledge and add new knowledge as the species of man continues to regenerate and learns from new experiences. Since each generation is a newcomer into man's environment, each individual needs to know where he is, what he is, why he is, who he is, and then what to do about it. The first four of these are the fundamentals that have to be established in the mind before the fifth, what to do about it, can be placed by the individual where it belongs in his life. What to do about it becomes a matter of personal choice. The accumulation and availability of knowledge in this category is virtually without limit in these modern times, so there has developed a trend toward compressing, streamlining, and omitting among the basic fundamentals in order to make more knowledge available about what to do. This trend has resulted in what is sometimes crudely referred to as a society of highly educated fools. Students are educated into possession of high-level intellect that is not attached to or based on knowledge of and feeling for the fundamentals. Intensive specialization further contributes to bypassing of the fundamentals. This trend is in part due to acceleration in progress, but it is more the result of deliberate planning to deviate education. The idea of the planners is to prepare the student to fit into the framework of the modern artificial way of life without questioning it or having enough knowledge of basics to realize that it is an unnatural, artificial, man-made framework. With this purpose in mind, the planners divert education away from things that develop God-given talents of competitive individuality. There is no way the student can be kept from thinking for himself and exploring the talents he has by nature, but if he has been denied the spirit and feeling of fundamental basics, he has little chance of discovering his individual competitive potential. So without being able to discover and to develop his own power of individuality, the student has little choice but to fit into the ongoing way of life that surrounds him. From my point of view, this means of forcing society into conformity is a criminal evil act because it weakens the power of the sum of mind God has placed throughout society needed to guide its direction at any given time. This evil tampering with education is far-reaching in its effects and has played its part in the destruction of independent, competitive, free enterprise and local independence. It has repressed the development of talents in those with natural gifts for leadership. 
Many emerge who proclaim that they are leaders, but without understanding the fundamental basics about where, what, why, and who they are as individuals, they don't know what to do. So they obediently promote the will of those in higher authority without questioning. It seems we seldom even think of these as leaders anyway. We just call them politicians. The highly educated student of today, and we constantly hear encouragement for higher education, the highly educated student of today is more machine than human. He is like a computer full of knowledge, push his button and out comes an intellectual answer but he has limited feeling for how his knowledge fits into the common sense of man's position in the creation and the environment. Education has been deliberately deviated to produce human units of power that are controllable in a slave society, controllable because they have been denied the common sense of basics. This may seem to be a very far-out harsh accusation, but just think on it and look around. That's all I ask. Remember the philanthropic foundations and their power to establish educational policy through conformity required to receive funds. Then look and try to find an educational institution that is not receiving funds from philanthropic sources. Those who establish foundation policy are concealed in anonymity. At the lower level of education, the purpose is the same, only the method of diverting educational policy at the lower compulsory levels comes through federal policies and the power of enforcement. Legislation constructed around the Equal Rights Movement now lets federal authority bypass representation of the will of the people. Local school boards no longer have authority to respond to the popular preferences of the people, but have become instead the organization through which federal policy is dictated subject to federal power of enforcement right down to the individual citizen. Deviation of education is just one of the many components in the self-destructive trap we have built ourselves into. The entire trap is self-destructive because each component is self-destructive. Another reason the trap is doomed is because the planners of dictatorship have to rely upon units of human power they have educated to be imbecilic zombies with just enough common sense to obey their orders. Now the evil plan of enslavement has become so complex that it requires many people to arrange and expedite its almost infinite details. This requires more mind and sense than can flow from the planning source or than even exists in the planning minds at the top. So now the mind needed to execute the plan is becoming unavailable because its common sense has already been demented by the plan. It takes a lot of common sense even to carry out an evil plan. Machines and computers alone cannot replace common sense. So deviation in education was a self-defeating plan from the time of its evil conception. Now here is another condition relative to education regarding the instinctive nature of man. Man instinctively feels the need to know what he is, where he is, why he is, and who he is. He has a natural curiosity to know these and has to know them to feel secure and satisfy his survival instinct. If his understanding of these basics is slighted or denied, then something else has to be given to him in their place to distract his attention away from his dissatisfaction. Heavy emphasis has been placed upon sports and entertainment to distract and satisfy. Emphasis on sports in direct connection with educational facilities is the order of the day. This takes care of those at the student level, but education does not stop at this level. It is a lifelong continuity, although we may have forgotten to think of it this way. Through our modern mass communications media, the press and the electronic, this continuity of education beyond the student level has come into proportion never before possible, even to the extent that people have become addicted to the new source. It is hard to realize just how much educational information is received through the modern media. This is a very good place, however, to casually remind that education can be either in things that are good or things that have evil origin. Well, anyway, what was said about omission and substitution applies to education by way of the media. The same substitution by sports and entertainment is used. 
We are at this time a very distracted people, traveling on an uncharted course at an ever-increasing rate of speed. It's typical of a youngster to try to find out just how fast he can run, and he does. When his feet can no longer keep up with the rest of him, then he knows, but too late to keep from going down hard. Now here is still another outstanding facet related to education in the broad sense, and this is in regard to heritage. Heritage is, of course, brought forward from generation to generation through education, by word of mouth, by written record, by pictures, by artifacts, by traditions, and in these modern times by various audiovisual devices. Carefully selected bits are still coming through educational channels. Heritage has to have a living spirit of feeling to be of real value. It has to be felt as well as known in the form of intellectual fact. We are inclined to think of heritage as something that is lost a little bit at a time as the generations pass by, a little bit becoming lost forever with each passing. Since we believe it to be this way, we let it happen this way. Now I want to explain something here which you may find to be new and valuable to yourself as well as to society at large. We seem to have the general idea that heritage is something that just happened to come in existence at some time in the past, instead of realizing that heritage had to grow into existence out of a spirit that prevailed and guided the hearts and souls of people. Society is not a mass of equality or sameness, but instead a sum of individuals, each having been given his own spirit, his own talents, and his own right of choice. Each individual has some piece of heritage, be it ever so small, that is living and growing as a part of the spirit that he feels. This means that throughout the multiplying society of man at any given time, there exists a tremendous sum of heritage that is alive in spirit and growing with our numbers. From this we see that heritage is a living thing that can actually grow as generations pass by if it is exchanged and shared along with our other God-given talents. Mine is to me a most wonderful priceless heritage that has come not only through family lineage but also through many sources. My curiosity about basics cannot be satisfied with substitutions, and I am more or less sensitive about things being omitted. I like to know just what I am looking at, and I like to know just what I am hearing. When I find the things that fit together and I believe them to be valuable, then I feel obligated to make them available to others however I can, in the hope that they may add some valuable bit to the spirit that keeps heritage alive and growing. Now topic number seven, summary and conclusions. I realize that I have dumped a lot onto your head here in just a few minutes, things I thought you might like to know and I understand your right of choice to make such disposition of them as you see fit. In casual conversations I have found that many people believe that if we have any serious national problems develop, the Federal authorities will know about them and enforce whatever measures are needed for their correction. Then some believe that if anything serious develops the people won't stand for it. Whatever that means, they don't carry it any further. And I find some who think maybe we do have some very serious problems, but would just rather not know about them. Some of my very own kin express this position, so I respectfully honor their right of choice. Now let me summarize what has been covered here and add some bits of addendum in the following eighteen points. 1. From the visible effects we see in our modern way of life, the truth about causes producing these effects cannot be readily determined. 2. Our modern way of life is a man-made structure for existence in violation of a natural means of existence. 3. By constructing an artificial life support structure, man has built himself into a self-destructive trap that is baited with irreplaceable energy removed from deposits in the earth. 4. The species of man existed for 5,000 years before discovering the way to multiply his productive power many thousandfold by using energy taken from the earth. 5. 
The modern artificial way of life is unprecedented in all known history. 6. All persons now living were born into the age of modern progress. Only a very few have realized that progress has constructed an artificial way of life bound for self-destruction. 7. Modern economy is not a natural economy of independent competitive free enterprise, but is instead controlled by the self-regenerating wealth of corporate monopoly, which is assisted by government, also under its control. 8. The dollar no longer has reserve backing to give it a fixed reference value, so it has become a commodity, having a different value at different places in the economy, resulting in economic anarchy. 9. Alterations have been made in government which reverse its position as servant of the people. The people are now servants of the will of government without representation. Now the individual is held directly responsible to the federal level of enforcement. 10. Legislation altering the structure and spirit of government has been constructed around such things as the benefit programs and the rights legislation under the deception that freedom and enforced equality are one and the same thing. 11. Binding society to equality and removing effective representation has denied our nation the sum of individual mind power needed to guide the course of the society and national affairs. 12. The few minds in control of the nation have not the mind needed to guide even a slave society. The artificial structure they have masterminded and used the power of the people to build is no longer controllable and is beginning to collapse. 13. Deviation in education has been accomplished at the higher levels through influence of philanthropy and at the lower levels through federal guidelines and enforcement of federal laws. 14. Education has slighted basics substituting sports and entertainment to satisfy natural curiosity to know the basic truths. 15. The keys to how the power of a people is used may be found in three words, anonymity, incredibility, and philanthropy. 16. The basic weakness in society that lets it become enslaved may be found in its ignorance, complacency, and laziness. 17. Heritage is a living spirit that can be let die out or can grow as it is exchanged and shared, since each individual has his own bit of the spirit to share. Traditional images that are burned into our minds, such as that of an old cracked bell, serve more to bring forward the deceptive illusion that we still live in a great land of the free, while day by day the freedom once guaranteed slips away as we are enforced into the clutches of dictatorship. 18. Society becomes enslaved by its own power of enforcement since there is no other power. Motivation of the power of society works through its belief that it must obey an anonymous source of authority which has no real power until the power in society supports it. Now I believe these things fairly well describe in brief the state of our position in history at this time. There is no doubt in my mind that we are at the end of a most spectacular, progressive, squanderous, wasteful period in history. By the grace of God, some now living may survive the collapse of our man-made trap and be allowed to begin a new era. Man had lived for 5,000 years within the limits of a natural existence, then we came along and blew it. Down through history man has found many other ways to blow his chance. We have used all of his old tricks to build our trap and then found a new trick of our own without precedent, the use of energy from the earth to bait our new modern trap. There is no doubt we have upstaged anything that has ever gone before, and I'm not proud that I too made contribution to it before finding out what modern progress is all about. Now I am caught in it along with all the rest. This thing we are trapped in has been evil from its conception many years ago, but most of those who have contributed to its construction are, I believe, basically innocent of wrongdoing. 
However, we learn from biblical history that God is not hesitant about descending His wrath upon the just right along with the unjust. Evidently, He has ways of compensating for things that we are not given to understand. I like to believe that God may allow survivors to begin a new era. But if this be the case, I am sure that this era will have to end with severity that will completely kill its evil spirit. There would really be no point in surviving just to continue the tribulation of collapsing into eventual oblivion, trying to make things work man's way and Satan's way instead of God's way. I don't suppose we have earned the privilege of having another chance, by and large. When I look around and see the waste of things God has provided for us to work with, I'm sure we don't deserve another chance. We have not been respectful guests in God's creation. Most of us will do whatever we have to do to save our own skins if we find out we are about to be skinned alive, but not until then. That is just what the jaws in our trap are all sharpened up to do, but we have no honest leaders who possess the courage to tell us the truth. Many in high office have worked within the house of evil so long they are blind to the truth. But in spite of all the brainwashing we have been through as a people, there is still the power of mind and body in our nation to come out of the trap into safety, but there is no one to lead us out as yet. The people would rise up and find the leaders among our great numbers if they realized the truth. Our fate hangs on knowledge of the truth. The answer has to come through spirit, good spirit, the Spirit of God and Christ, where there is only truth. We are a people groping in darkness with eyes that do not see past the blinding illusion set before us by worshipers of Satan, while they enslave the innocent to use their power to gain control of all that is of the earth. We need teachers and leaders who will guide us in the ways God meant for man to live. The evangelists tell us how to die. But in the meantime, we want to live, exchange, and share our God-given differences in a free nation guided by the represented sum of our differences. The Founding Fathers gave us the structure that set us free to share our best, and it worked. Our people need to know what has happened to it, how it has happened, who made it happen, and why we let it happen. Now let me make a sharp turn here and be very contradictory, then I will explain. I know many things at this hour that need to be known by all people of our nation if there is to be any hope of saving ourselves from total disaster. But I am not revealing all that I know at this time. When the time comes, it may already be too late for the truth to save anything at all of this most spectacular era in the history of man. What is at stake is a nation of people, possibly even a world. The individual can always save his soul, if not his body, by making his peace with God. But no one or few can save the sum of body and the sum of soul of a nation. It takes the power of the sum of national spirit to save a nation of people. The spirit that can save has to be good spirit composed of many things desire, willingness, love, unity, confidence, patriotism, and all that God has given man in spirit. The few dedicated patriots who have given all they could find to give to light the desire for truth have succeeded only in lighting a glimmer here and there that would either go out like a wet match or be quenched out by those in position of evil power. As long as the trap stays well baited and no national catastrophe is felt, there is not the spirit to do anything other than rest, squander, and enjoy. From the beginning educators have known that to teach first there has to be the desire to learn. We have not at this time the national desire to learn, and will not have it until it becomes triggered by something that shocks the spirit of the nation into consciousness of reality. The communications networks are held closed to the whole truth by those who control them, as is the press media, except for a few independent publishers, most of whom fear to make a glimmer. 
All major avenues through which truth could flow to the mass populace are blocked. From these existing conditions I have to believe that there is some reason beyond the limit of finite understanding, some kind of plan even greater than that for man's enslavement by a few. It may be that we must come yet closer to losing it all, maybe even lose most of what we have, before we are willing as a people to open our eyes wide enough to see for the first time what we have done and realize that it was wrong. I have found that among those who have received the truth and believe it to be true, one is seldom found who is really ready. They ask helplessly, What can I do? Well, if a man steps on a hot coal of fire with his bare foot, he doesn't helplessly ask, What can I do? He uses the sense God gave him and thinks of something to do and fast. So it seems that for reasons beyond my understanding, the nation as a people is not yet ready to receive the truth. Perhaps some justice of punishment may be involved. Perhaps we have it coming for giving up our gift of individuality too easily and not using the sense we were given to try to overcome our weaknesses of ignorance, complacency, and laziness, and our greed. Perhaps nothing short of unthinkable calamity will kill the evil spirit that has possessed our era of progress. The thing we looked upon as progress toward achieving a higher level of civilization than ever before achieved turned out not to be that kind of progress at all. It brought no more security, contentment, or happiness than ever before achieved. It brought on the hardship and oppression of hopeless enslavement in an unnatural, artificial, man-made way of existence, and the disillusionment of conveniences that really were not convenient in view of the overall final cost. If someone painfully asks what went wrong, then I feel obligated to tell all as best I understand it. But it may be that by that time there will be no one left who knows the answers. This may be the time to think ahead into what would be needed to begin a new era just in case God's will may allow a new beginning. To get an idea about what might be needed, first we need to look back at what we were and what we had that didn't work out. If we project our mind into the future and look back at what must have turned into a writhing mess, it looks almost totally impossible to have been occupied by the species of man. So much is unnatural. It must be a satanic miracle that it survived as long as it did. Things that must have been self-destructive, squanderous, and wasteful litter the face of the earth, and its resources must have never before been so scattered and lost to usefulness. Zooming in closer reveals an infinite number of little devices with intricate complexity, sheets and cards beyond counting with writings, markings, and numbers on them. Whatever the order of things was, it must not have worked well. It appears to have been added on to until it must have finally exceeded the limits of comprehension in man's finite mind. Those great craters in the earth seem to have leveled, smelted, and rendered their proximity unfit for life. That must be what terminated their most spectacular of all eras in futility, and it must show the means of its final self-destruction. It is easy to see from this perspective of thinking why the represented sum of mind throughout a society has to be the mind that guides the society. No one or few minds could contain the magnitude of intelligence needed. God maintains the level of mind needed at any given time to guide the society of man on its intended course by placing the mind among individual gifts of talent. The governing structure given to us by the Founding Fathers made it possible for society to have the benefit of this mind to conduct a free society. We have allowed this to be taken away. The way to begin a new era will have to be, once again, a nation under God, returning to a natural, decentralized, decontrolled, competitive, free enterprise society that is governed by the represented sum of its own free mind. Then all that needs to be known about what to do will come through the mind God has given in the individual talents He intends for man to share. Every individual makes some contribution to society, 
however each has choice. Whether he contributes from the spirit of Satan by greed for that which is only of the earth, or through love of sharing his best with his fellow beings, he contributes from the spirit of God. I thank you for allowing me to share these thoughts with you. Signed, Tom Wilson